Testing, 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 testing. Stream, preach on. We get. All right, I guess we are what they call live now for, for all of you um, online. And those of you here in person, I welcome you to our Tuesday Bible study. We are going to continue with our um, study of Ephesians 6, 1 through 4. I, is it not amazing how we spend two periods on four verses? Um I personally, okay, this is going to be, I'm just going to be short with the criticism. I personally think that um, that maybe he overdoes this a little bit, but we're going to get into some concepts that don't have to do with parenting because he, he goes, Tom Holliday, whose study we're following here in Ephesians, goes into some things about um, about parenting and some of his own personal experiences. And as all of you know, and all of you out there joining us online know that I am the foremost expert in biblical parenting since I have no kids. So listen to me, because I know what's best. Do as I say, not as I do, right? <laughs> you know, it's funny because he starts this part two of this study by saying this. Some of you are thinking, I'm a sing. I, I'm. I'm a single. I've never heard it phrased like that. I am a single. Okay, I'm single, and we don't have any kids. Does this relate to me? Yes, it does for several reasons. One, you probably know some parents. They probably get depressed sometimes that they might need to be pointed to some things in Scripture. You can help them out. Um, I believe in the family of God. We all should encourage one another when the Bible says, says encourage one another. It doesn't say encourage all those over 18 years of age in the body of Christ. Um, let me read the verses over again so we know what we're studying here. Ephesians 6, 1 through 4. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment, with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Okay, so last week we talked about how, okay, if this is a commandment, how, and it's the first commandment with a promise, now, if you obey, if you children obey their moms and dads, now, and they're never going to do that without fail because none of us do everything perfectly. So the promise to them is that it'll go well with you, and you're going to have a long life on earth. Now, um, that's not necessarily true. There are probably lots of good kids, young people, that have unfortunately, you know, become terminally ill or been in accidents, or um, so. That gets tricky. Um, I think I don't remember exactly how Tom Holiday tried to explain that last week, and I appreciate it. Maybe you do too, when people don't try to explain things that they can't explain. Um, I'll give you an example. I've used this over and over again. Someone's child is sick, or someone has been devastated by some awful, painful occurrence in their life, and some profound Christian pastor or friend comes and tells him, well, it, you know, I'm not trying to be sarcastic, but to someone who's lost and heard this, they probably would take it as such. 
well, it was the Lord's will and he wanted that angel for himself and he's going to make you strong and you just need to trust in him and and he's going to get you through this and if you just pray hard enough and you don't know how God's working that event in someone's life. So I think this is just my opinion. It's best just to sit there and have a ministry of presence with someone because you don't know. You don't have any profound words of wisdom and the mind of God to be able to tell someone why this is happening. And I, I think it's important to for people to remember that. So, um, so that promise, you know, that you're going to have a long life and it's going to go well with you. I think that point, this is just me thinking what I will always point that out. If scripture doesn't say it out, right. I will say it's my, my idea of what, what it means. It may go well with you and you will have long life. I think that might be just a, a case of good order. In other, in other words, when we do what's right and when we do what's expected of us and when we do what the law commands or the laws of the land, which are loosely based on the Ten Commandments. Anyway, we things go better for us. When we go against everything and we start breaking all the rules, you start getting punished, you start getting criminal records, you, things don't go well for you. The long life part, I have to defer and say, I don't have an answer for you there. I don't understand. And let, could that be everlasting life? It doesn't exactly say that, but... Maybe, um, but you, we don't want to tie everlasting life to obeying commands because we all know that Jesus was the only one that could do that perfectly. So that get, it gets tricky. And I've also talked about how this is not um, this is not a one way street. You know, I think I mentioned last week. My dad once asked me, um, "How can you how can you expect a kid?" to obey and honor a parent who's beating on them all the time or emotionally abusing them. So this, there is a responsibility. It's a two-way street um, for people to, for parents to treat their kids and for kids to obey their parents. Obey parents and parents are supposed to raise your kids according to the word of God. And discipline doesn't mean abuse. So... All right, so, okay, he goes on to say, encourage one another. Yeah, it doesn't say just encourage all those over 18 years of age. We're supposed to encourage everybody in the body of Christ. He said, thirdly, we're going to talk about and take a look at how our words can relate to any family you're going to find. Um, let's see, Jesus said, many of the principles we're going to talk about relate not only to child raising, which I'm an expert in, but to all relationships and how they work or don't work in our lives. So our words, how we can use our words as a godly tool. Um, see, James said, if anyone, he quotes James here, if anyone doesn't stumble in the way he uses his tongue, he is absolutely perfect. We all stumble in the way we use our mouth and... Um, I would probably hazard a guess that I have uh, outdone a lot of people when it comes to stepping on my tongue. Uh, yeah, have you ever said something to someone and in your head it sounded like a compliment, and then so it comes out of your mouth, you're like, "Oh, that that that's not the way it sounded in my head," because it comes out offensive, or it comes out sarcastic, or, or it comes out self-righteous. There's all kinds of ways you can stumble um, with your tongue, and it it, it get it gets you into trouble sometimes. So, um, let's see. I like this because he starts to talk about people that are anxious. I, I, I don't know exactly how this relates to this these verses, to be honest with you, but he breaks into it. And he says... The Bible says in a great verse in Proverbs, when somebody's worried, you need to speak kindly. Speak with kindness. Um, an anxious heart, this is from Proverbs 12, 25, an anxious heart weighs a man down, but a kind word cheers him up. Uh, the proverb says that the opposite of anxiety, the word that you can use to help somebody when they're anxious is a word of kindness. 
And he says here, is your, I got a point coming up here. Is your home a dark attic of anxiety or a bright place of peace? One of the things that's going to make the difference is the kind of words you choose to use. Kind words bring a smile to people's hearts. They focus, they focus us in a little more on joy than the Lord has in a situation. This verse that a kind word has the ability to take the problem of worry and translate it into God's joy. You can make a real difference by choosing to speak kindly. Do you know why kindness makes a difference when we worry? Kindness is caring in about the details, the ability to care about the details. He says, how I usually respond when somebody is worrying, whether he says his wife's name or one of his kids, is everything is going to be okay. The prophet has spoken, he says. Everything's fine and I can walk away. I'm sure they won't worry anymore. That was sarcastic. Um... You can't stop people who are worried by saying, well, just don't worry about it. I, I was about, was it about a year? Yeah, no, November, because it was close to Thanksgiving. And I remember I was in the hospital. It seems to be like my place of choice in the last year, a couple of years. Um, I, I was in Springfield over, over Thanksgiving. And my stomach just wouldn't stop hurting and it was bloated and it got to be like two o'clock in the morning and I was at my mother-in-law's house and I got mad. I was like, I'm sick of this. And I just drove to the hospital. Um, I don't even remember getting there. I was just so angry because, you know, I was like, oh, what's next, you know? And I went in there and I said, yeah, and they asked me all these questions and I, I you know, I answered, I'm like, yeah, 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 this, 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 this has been going on. And how long and blah, blah, blah. And I tried to skip all that. Anyway, the point, Julie showed up and we're there at two o'clock in the morning. And then um, all my labs are good. And the doctor says, we're just waiting on the CAT scan. And then he comes in. He said, I've been waiting there forever. And he comes in and he says, well, good news. And that's what I hear. I'm like, okay, I overreacted. I, you know, I don't, indigestion, who knows. Um, and he says, well, the good news is we know what's going on. You have appendicitis. I mean, never tell somebody they got appendicitis by introducing it as good news. Anyway, um, and I said, and I said, what, I can't remember exactly. I said, yeah, I've been, you know, I've been worrying a lot lately. This is, I think this is before, oh no, I, I think I was saying everything I've been worrying about has been happening in the last, everything that I think is going on right now, it seems to be the worst case scenarios. He is, well, you just need to, you probably should stop worrying then. And I thought, I know this, I told, I think I might have said, I said, you didn't, you, you're not a psychiatrist, are you? Because you would not have a job if that worked. I think so. I, I said it. Well, I think they had given me medication, so I don't. Um. But the point being is you just can't tell someone not to worry. That doesn't, that doesn't get it done. Many of us are prone, I am, are prone to anxiety. I am. And I, I mean, some people get worried when there's things to worry about. You know, you get some bad news or you're waiting for a test result and you're nervous. That's normal. But I will things all the time that aren't happening or could happen or when I'm feeling... Um, when I feel fine and I'm not anxious, I got to find something to worry about because I think you've ever heard this craziness that if you worry about it, you can stop it from happening. That way it won't catch you from behind because you don't want to let your guard down. You're afraid you'll get hit, you know? So you defend yourself by worrying all the time. I know it's a crazy concept, but Like he says, oh, stop, everything's going to be okay. Now, to a little kid, when mom and dad says that, mom and dad can make everything okay, according to a child. But as we get older, we know someone tells us, it's going to be all right. Now, that is reassuring sometimes if someone doesn't give us the worst case scenario. You know, yeah, I'd be scared too. You get those test results and they're bad. It could mean you're going to die soon. You know, I mean, you're not going to tell somebody that. I think, have you ever heard people say, I've heard pastors say it. And unfortunately, um, like what we're, ta- we're, we're called to speak the truth. I might have used this example in here. Um, some guys I know uh, were talking and they're, they're, they had couples come into them that were living together and wanted to be married. And he's like, well, I insisted that they separate. And I said, okay, I, I understand that. And 
and they explained why they couldn't, some financial burden, and they already had a child, and, and it just wouldn't have been, um, it wouldn't have been practical or financially feasible for them to separate. And he's like, well, Mike told him, hey, I, I've got better, I've got a full schedule, so if you don't want me to do your wedding based on those uh, contingencies, then uh, then that's fine. You know, I did my job, I told him the truth, and I said, this was like a get together of pastors. They call it pals, which is like for pastors that are new for the first three years. And um, he said, well, I'm, I'm called to tell those people the truth. I said, well, you're called to love those people. And I think, I think Luther said, speak the truth in love. You know, you could say a lot of things that are true that are not kind. I mean, you know, you don't see a heavier person walking down the street and stop them and say, you know what? You could lose a few pounds. That's the truth. You didn't lie. That's not kind. So I had a little trouble with his philosophy on telling the truth with that. You know, it's uh, I did my job. I've, I've never I don't think a pastor should speak in terms like that. Well, I laid down the Ten Commandments and they didn't want to obey them. So I just kicked the dust off my feet. I, I felt like that sometimes, but you, you can't do that. I, I don't think you can treat people like that if you're a pastor. That's not loving someone. Because how many of you have parents have wanted, have wanted to be done with your kids when they're driving you up a wall after a while? You know, I, I, you're not going to put them out. You love them, but they're getting on your very last nerve. So I'm sure, I'm guessing. Maybe I'm guessing wrong. Okay, and he goes on to say, but when you're worried, you need to tell somebody the details. Doesn't it help when you're worried um, just to have someone else to talk it through? And I think what he's trying to say here, I think he's trying to talk about how parents should encourage their kids. How do you not exasperate your children? When the situation calls for it, use kind words. You, you would not believe, you probably know the power of a kind word to someone who's having an awful day, or maybe you're the only person that they've spoken to that day. And you say, hi, how are you doing? Or, or whatever. They, or they, maybe they confide in you and you just listen, smile, or pat them on the back, or tell them I understand, or, or whatever. The power of a kind word lifts somebody from the bottom of the depths to the sky sometimes. So um, I have actually been in situations where I'm the person that was having a horrible, horrible day, a horrible time. And someone said something kind and uplifting to me and it just did, I just did a 180. I mean, I wasn't like euphoric or anything, but I, my whole attitude toward life changed, you know, that day, be based on someone's kind words to me. Okay, when someone is angry, what are you supposed to do? Uh, speak gently, usually the way we handle it. When someone's angry, when they're speaking loud, we speak more loudly. We want them to hear how they have to change. But this is such a tremendous verse, one that many of you have in the back of your mind. Um, and it's a gentle answer turns away wrath. And how difficult is it to be gentle when someone is barking at you? Um, one of the things that I've struggled with um, in my life, and more so since I had a heart attack, is sometimes my temper. Um, I'm not proud of it, but it's not. When someone barks at you, your instinct is to snap right back at them. You know, and thank, the, thank God that he doesn't do that to us because he has every right um, and there, I just read a book on anger. A friend of mine lent it to me. You know, it's a Christian book, you know, and there's, there's unjust anger, you know, like with envy and jealousy. And then there's righteous anger when you're actually angry with someone who has done something wrong to you, but there is a wrong way to react um, to, unjust, to, to righteous anger. You know, you can be, you can have a good reason to be angry and then react to it in an ungodly way. You know, someone, if someone cuts you, hits you or almost causes an accident, well, that's probably a just, you have a right to be angry if they were texting or something. But when you jump out of the car and start calling them every cuss word in the book, then you have not reacted 
in, in a righteous way. But I think this is more on the tone of this verse of how you speak to your kids um, when they're angry. I don't know if you've I'm guessing most of you who have kids and grandkids have been in shouting matches with them because that's just how it goes with sinners sometimes, you know. You're right and they're wrong, and let's just say that's the case, and they don't want to listen. Um, And and you show them where they're wrong, and they're like, well, I don't care. I mean, arguments get loud. They don't remain calm. Because anybody who argues in a voice like this tends to frighten me. But anyway. um, So, gentleness and quietness, being meek, um, as long as you're not speaking as loudly as the other person, you speak with a soft tone in your voice. That's that's a gentle answer. Um, (laughs) I'm going to tell you this. Um, When I was on Vicarage... I did, I was doing um, a Bible study about cults. And so I took some online, I did it on purpose. I took some online evaluation for the Church of Scientology. And I was going to share it with everybody, what they said I needed and what my problems were. And, uh, you know, it said I was, had toxic relationship. I I wish I had it to show you. It was, it was kind of comical. And I I had one of our, our, um, our youth read it, and I, I put it up there, and I said, well, what kind of problems do I have according to this, this inventory of the Church of Scientology? Anyway, they started calling me, because you have to put in, before you can take these things, you have to put in your information. And they kept calling me, and calling me, and calling me. And finally, I said, I don't believe in this craziness that you, I can't even understand the dynamics of what you believe because it's so, there's nothing concrete. It's so abstract. I said, L. Ron Hubbard was a, I said, he was a science fiction writer. That's all he wrote. And I was talking like this. She remained calm, never raised her voice, even though I was raising mine. They trained them never to get mad, never to respond to yelling and screaming and anger with the same. And you know what that did to me? That made me feel like a jerk. (laughs) So we ended up having a decent conversation. Now, we did not. We agreed to disagree. But I'm sure it's a manipulation tactic as far as they're concerned. But um, there's something to be said about meeting anger and hatred and yelling with meekness because I looked like the fool and then I felt like the fool and then I reacted in a an apologetic kind of way so you know the Lord's philosophy when you hear the great wisdom in Proverbs God knows what he's talking about um, let's see As parents, as Christians, sometimes we, and that when I say we, I mean you as parents, don't realize how important our advice is to other people. It's not that important to us sometimes. We don't think we know that much, and that's true. I think a lot of times we belittle ourselves um, as far as how much wisdom we have to offer somebody else. We think, well, we're not that smart. We haven't had that many experiences, so we, we refrain um, from from sharing some information with somebody because we think that it's not going to benefit them. So when another Christian comes and asks us for advice or one of our kids, one of your kids asks you for advice, even if it's a small thing, we think it's not important and give something off the top of our head. And then he quotes Proverbs 25, 11. The right word spoken at the right time is as beautiful as gold apples in a silver bowl. People enjoy giving good advice. Saying the right word at the right time is so pleasing, it can change people's lives. As long as you don't start to think that, um, that you are the only one that knows the right way to address something. Um, if you've met people like that, that um, they're, my dad's the kind of person that solicits advice on a matter from 10 different people. And guess how many different answers he gets? Yeah. Well, so-and-so said this. Then I called, so, yeah, 11, Dennis, <laughs> his own, too. 
Well, heck, that's the, he, he's the master. Oh, I love him, but he he will solicit advice. And he'd be like, "Nah, that ain't right." Well, then, you know, then you're like, "Why'd you ask?" If you know better. <laughs> But the point is that people do care about what you think. They do care about the information you have to offer. And when it comes from here, it means something. God has something for you to say and for you to share with your kids and with other people. And sometimes it's a, a word of, uh, I hate to use the word because I was called to do this in my ordination, to rebuke, um, you know, to... Uh, tell somebody that they're going the wrong direction with their life, you know, um, and that might be easier to do with a child, with one of your children, because you feel like you have the right. That is the parental responsibility that you've been given is to lead them, to discipline them and make sure they don't go down a dark road. And if that means advising them, Hey, you're screwing up. You need to stop going that way and go this way, or your life's going to end up here. Um, you know, I, I think it's awesome when you see parents who've made so many mistakes and they advise and they advise their kids and they, and they um, discipline their kids and their kids will come back and say, well, who are you to say this to me? Look at everything you did wrong. But what they don't understand is their parents are trying to keep them from ending up where they were, you know, and I think that's important. Um, because they, they know what consequence lies behind that action. Yeah, Dennis. Well, what Dennis is, I try to repeat people's people's comments for the, uh, people joining us online. Dennis says he wouldn't want to raise a child in, in this day and age. And I, I can understand that um, because there's, it seems like everything's relative. There's no truth. It's only what's right for you. As long as it doesn't hurt somebody else, how, how can, how can there just be one truth or one way of doing things? And how do you raise a child to understand the truths that are in the Bible when they go everywhere they go, they're being taught the exact opposite. And I, th that's gotta be tough. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure some of you are, have you seen your, your grandkids being exposed to, I mean, I, I know every generation of this day and age is awful, but I can't, I can't imagine a, a, a culture where, you know, people have to address their children who want to, um, to go out and identify as an animal or, um, you know, today I'm going to go to school. I'm going to be a girl, even though you're a boy. I, 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 if someone was watching that kind of, that kind of, uh, goes accepts that kind of thinking they're probably angry with me right now but i i consider myself it probably to a fault sometimes um not condemning but sometimes not enough you've got to hold to the truths of scripture and you can't be a yes man when somebody's doing wrong and sometimes i in order not to hurt someone's feelings. I don't think I'm strong enough. But one thing that bothered me, Julie had a friend um, that she saw, you know, on Facebook, you know, one of the, the I know it, it, social media, I'm not on any of them, but they can be used as, as great tools, but they can also be 
hot messes, you know. Anyway, a friend of hers that she went to high school with, they had, uh, I was a, I don't know, five-year-old kindergartner, something like that. Maybe a little older, maybe first grader. Anyway, um, the little boy decided he wanted to wear dresses to go and go to school and wanted to be a little girl. And they encouraged it and let him do that. And I thought, what kind of parent does that? Kids do all kinds of funny things when they're playing dress up and whatever. But a- allowing them to say I, I, to actually act like a girl and go to school in, in, in girl shoes and a dress and makeup, I I. I I couldn't, that's one of the things that made me become a, what's against my personality. I, I, I was like, that's, that's disgusted me, actually. Because what you're doing is just confusing that kid. I'm not a parent, but you're just confusing that kid more. I mean, he's five or six. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and they may have never given it a thought, but this spurs it on. And then they start to think, well, maybe I'll give this a try or that a try. Uh, I know that has happened in some of the California schools. My son lives out there. Oh, yeah. In sixth grade, they decide to find out, are you comfortable with where you're at? My son sends his kids to a Christian school. Mm-hmm. They are. Yeah. It's, it's, um, I've been told, I don't know when I say that I don't pass it off as truth, but I was guest preaching at a church near here. It doesn't matter where, cause I don't, I don't want to give nuts and bolts particulars, but he was telling me that some of the kids were being asked to not take their text, take their books home. They were asked to keep information from their parents about what was being taught there. And I thought, what, I mean, it, it didn't make any sense to me. And, and number one, when you're talking about talking to your kids about gender and who they are, I mean, is it me? or I mean, don't boys hate girls up until they're in like seventh grade and vice versa? I mean, I know there's no uniform thought on that. But to start putting thoughts in a little kid's head about, well, what do you identify? They, don't, they can't possibly know what you're talking about. Because I probably played with dolls or did something that was just for little girls, but I sure didn't ever think I was a girl. I don't mean to get on a soapbox here, but that you can see that bothers me. Um, at letting uh, a kid identify as an animal if it's not just for fun at playtime, um, at you know, I don't get it. So I, I agree, Dennis. I can't imagine. Um, what these kids are exposed to and how confused they got to be by what they learn at home and how that's being opposed at where they learn, what they learn, everything else, everywhere else. Um, so uh, parenting and, and the word of God, I think is now more important. It's always been important, but it, it's got to be a stronghold for parents. Now it's got to be something they cling to. One of the great things, I can't say God's working that way. I can't because he has not told me, but the, Enrollment in Christian schools is up. People are taking their kids out of that, out of that mess. Um, and our public schools here, I know, are good as far as education. But when they start, you know, insisting on teaching sex, sex education in that manner and teaching it so young, I mean, kids need to learn. But what are they learning? I, 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 it confuses me, those pronouns. I mean, it sounds, have you ever, everybody's heard the Abbott and Costello, who's on first? That's what it sounds like to me. What's on second? Who's on first? Uh, how's it going third, Dennis? Is, okay, yeah. That, they, who, what? I mean, I don't mean to be cute about it, but that's how it gets to me. I could never, even if I wanted to agree with all that, I could never keep up with that. Well, I'm a they. No, they is plural, you know. I, di- I digress. Um, you can tell this was written in the 90s by Tom Holliday. But when your daughter was 12 and choosing a prom dress, that was a big decision. Then when one of your kids was eight and they were choosing how to use their Christmas money, that seems to be the big decision for our kids this year. You can tell he's not in this. This is not this generation. We say no then and we lose some of the right to help later. 
So you can tell if that's the kind of questions that he's addressing as a parent back then, you can tell Dennis he's not, that's not living in this age. So, um, yeah, I, we long for the good old days. Um, he says, you, I don't know if I want to get into that, because a lot of these start getting into personal stories. Um, he goes on to talk about speaking encouragingly. And I think his connection to this is how, is how you speak to your kids and how you encourage them. But this goes on how he's kind of branching out and how you speak to Christians in general or other people. You're not hateful. You're not mean. You speak the truth and love. And he uses 1 Thessalonians 2, 11 through 12. For you know that we dealt with each other with each of you, as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God. That's how a father talks. That's how a loving heavenly father talks. That's how a loving earthly father talks. Not just to his kids, but to everybody. And I don't just mean men, okay? Moms, women, that's how we're supposed to talk to one another. Encourage. And sometimes people make that hard for us. You know, when they... Um, are hateful or sarcastic or smart aleck. That was, uh, that was what, in, when I was younger, that was the term that was used, smart aleck, except aleck was not the A word. Um, he said, sometimes we live in sort of alternative homes on the range where seldom is heard an encouraging word and the skies remain cloudy all day. That was funny. Ann Landers, he says, is she still in the paper? Is she still, is she, she, She's okay. Yeah, I, I thought so. But I thought there was still an Ann Landers column. I knew she had passed. Okay. Was once asked uh, what the most common question of all millions of questions that she received, what was the most common? And she said, the most common question is, what's wrong with me? A lot of that is built in our homes. There are millions and millions of people growing up with this secret sense of failure, often because the people that were closest to them, their family never took the time to offer words of encouragement. Pleasant words of encouragement have an awesome power. They have the power to bring healing to a family and sweetness to our disposition. Okay, I'm gonna bring, I'm gonna give you um, my interpretation of of how things at home can affect someone. Okay. Um, I believe that a parent's duty is to encourage their kids. I believe that a parent's duty is to discipline their kids. Now, I give a whole bunch of grief to my dad. My dad did both. I got, you, Dennis, God bless you, never had to raise your voice to your kids. Now, um, I got a lot worse than that, but I deserved it. Um, I remember um, that we were at, um, did we have company or we were, we were out? Anyway, we were in, in front of people, and I told my dad, um, I'm embarrassed. I mean, as a little kid, but I'm embarrassed. I told him in front of a whole bunch of people, I said, why don't you just shove it? My dad did not make idle threats. Have you ever heard people do that? If you do that one more time, and they just say it over and over and over again, he goes, you're going to get a bleep whipping when we get home. He said, he, t he laughs at me to this day. He said, you were white as a sheep the whole way home. <laughs> and I got a spanking. When I got spanked when I got home. There was nothing wrong with that. He didn't abuse me, but he taught me that if you show me that kind of disrespect, and I, I, there is something hateful and, dis and hurtful about a child telling their parent to shove it in front of people so they can hear it. Not good, Kathleen. You are correct. It was not good. And I had it coming, and I knew that. And there, there was one time when, uh, when my parents first got divorced, and I was trying my dad because he picked me up. Now, I, he raised me, but at first I was living with my mom. But he had picked me up um, from my mom's for the weekend, and I knew I could mess with him. Okay? God, God forgive me. But kids do that sometimes to parents. He wanted to see me. And he said, well, you got to clean your room when you get home. I said, I'm not cleaning that room. Because I knew he wanted to see me so much. He said, if you don't, I'm going to take you back to your mom's. And I said, well, good for you. I'm not, I'm not cleaning my room. It's not that I was lazy and wasn't responsible and didn't want to clean my room. I was testing him. Because I knew he was looking so forward to that time with me. He did the thing that probably broke his heart in two. He took me back to my mom's. Because he had, and it was the right thing to do. I believe that. 
And I'm sure it tore him up. So, okay, well, my, I was getting off, off of my point. Yeah, their words of encouragement and words of discipline that are done in love at home, I think, affect the kid. But I also don't buy into the fact where maybe you think I'm wrong, and that's okay if you want to disagree, where these kids and people go out and they grow up and they're like, well, I had this horrible home life, and that's why I do all these stupid things. You are a grown person, and if you, you're in the Word, you know what's right and you know what's wrong. God gave you that inner knowledge of what right, what's right and wrong by your conscience. And, you know, um, now I know cycles of abuse, and I'm not, I'm not disputing that kind of thing. But you can't blame uh, a broken home or, or being yelled at or, or a parent who wasn't treating you right at home. You can't use that as an excuse as an adult to treat people like crud all the time. I don't believe that. I believe a human being, I think God gives you the ability to, to know right and wrong and to love other people and to see what was done to you was wrong. And you don't just get to, to, to beat up the whole world because things happen to you. I believe that. I believe you can't, you can't go um, blaming, you know, that you were called names at home. And so that's, how, that's why you treat other people so badly all the time. That's why you are so mean and so such a, a menace to society or whatever. You, you don't get to just forever as an adult blame what happened to you as a kid. That's my opinion. Um, and opinions are like, um, yeah. Are like feet. Everybody's got them, right? I mean, like. <laughs> okay. And the final thing he says is to take time to listen. James 119, my dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. I think one of the hardest things to do um, sometimes as Christians is to listen. Because we always want to get that, as a parent or as a friend, we want to get that advice out. We want to get some. We want to start talking, and uh, sometimes it's hard to resist that urge because I get to the point many times where I just want to blurt something out because that's, you know, it's not because I think I know everything. It's just kind of part of my mental makeup. I have a hard time. You know, how many times have you ever seen me sit still? You know, so blurting things out and. Um, but to sit there and calmly listen to someone so you truly know what it is that they're going through. Um, I think that's important. I think that's probably a more powerful ministry tool than what can come out of your mouth. Dennis? You have taken St. Stephen ministry class. Yeah. I'm sure that helped Yeah, we actually... Well, I had to actually... The seminary... Has, uh, Dennis thinks that the seminary should have given Stephen ministry training, and I agree that it's good training. Um, I don't know that they would have had the time, but we actually had to do um, – I, well, after I had my heart attack, I had set up um, one of uh, the guys at the seminary who actually does like the personality assessments and stuff of all the students there. He actually – um, I asked him to do like because he's a psychologist and a pastor to do a, a presentation on on, you know, the separation and how do you deal with covid and the lockdown um, mentally. I, I think he did that via, via Zoom, but I was out of it. Um, and they teach we do exercises. You take a whole class in it on active. It's the class is an active listening, but you do active listening, and which that means is you repeat back to someone what they said to you. You ever sit there? Where someone's talking to you and spaced out, and they'll ask, you, and they'll know, and they'll say, "What did I just say to you?" You don't have a clue. So, um, to actually hear people, to actually listen to what's going on, um, that's I think that's so much more valuable a lot of times than than uh, advice. I don't think most people come to pastors for advice most of the time. Because most of the experiences I've had aren't, aren't problems I can fix. I can pray for them. I can pray with them. I can hear them. I can let them know someone cares about what they're going through. Most people, that's what they want. They want someone to care that they're in pain. 
They want someone to know that their heart is broken. They want someone to know that and care that they're sad. And when they know that, I think that's, that's a powerful thing. Um, yes? I think sometimes when you go to speak with a pastor about an issue or a problem, you already know what the answer is going to be. I mean, I've gone in a few times over the course of my life to, to talk to pastors, and I already know what they're going to tell me pretty much before I go in there. I, 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 you know, you just want them to sanction their thought or disagree, and you already know they're going to. Yes, yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. She, you said that, that people come into pastor to most of the time they know what they're going to say. And I totally, totally agree. Some of them want permission to do what they know they shouldn't be doing. Um, I think a lot of them, though, they just want. I had someone come in with me just recently and man, what a story. And he told me after we were done, he had talked to other pastors and he's like, you know what? Um, I, he didn't know it until he said this. He said, I think, he goes, yeah, I've, you know, I've heard all the comfort, blah, blah, blah. He goes, he goes, I think I just needed someone to sit there and listen to me. Say, I just needed to get that off my chest. I think he, he's like, he came to the conclusion right then and there. I wasn't looking for someone to solve my problem. I just wanted to talk it out, you know, because guys are fixers. I'm a fixer. And my first inclination like, you know, when my wife comes to me with a problem, have you ever come to someone with a problem and, sorry, I'm going to pick on the husbands, and they go into fix mode and they're like, I just wanted you to listen to me. I didn't want you to go and try to fix my wife. You can't fix me. And, you know, my dad's the same way. You know, pick up the phone or whatever, get on, try to make thing everything all right. Not everybody wants you doing that. Because most of the time you can't. So, yeah. I think you're right. Most of the time they know what they're, what they're going to hear, you know. Um, I have now discipline is kind of, he gets into training, um, training and discipline. And he talks about how we're responsible to love our children if we have them. Um, and I have, I'm trying to get to where he talks about. about this. Okay, here, Hebrews 12. Okay. And he said, it's an incredible section of scripture about God's discipline and man's discipline and how they relate to each other and how it teaches us some things about discipline. And it goes like this, endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? If you are not disciplined and everyone goes, everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons. Uh, my children's message this past week was, you know, I was talking about the exiled Israelites, and I said God put them out of their homeland um, because they were doing wrong. But not because he just wanted to get rid of them. He wanted them to repent and to come back to him. And I used the, uh, you know, I asked how many of them had ever been in trouble, you know, and how many of them couldn't watch their show or play with their device or because they had done what mom and dad said they couldn't do. You know, they didn't want to raise their hands at first, but um, when everybody starts raising, yeah, they've all been in trouble. They've all gotten punished. And I, I, I was just trying to tell them, I said, that's an act of love. And they got these dumbfounded looks on their faces. You know, like, uh, I, I said, you didn't feel like love, did it? You know, they just, and uh, I said, but I'm going to, I said, I've I'm going to promise every one of you. I said, if mom and dad didn't care about you at all, they wouldn't care what you did wrong. You know, and I, that, that was kind of my, my go into, if God didn't love his children, he wouldn't, he wouldn't have disciplined them so they would come back to him. He cast out to bring back. Um, so his, he didn't just do this to watch the Israelites suffer. He wanted them to call back out to his name so they could be restored and to stop bowing down to these false gods and chasing things of the world that don't lead them anywhere but to eternal destruction. 
So that's, I think, how a loving father disciplines us. And I think, you know, as parents, it's like what my dad had to do to me when I challenged him about my room. How hard do you, you think he took pleasure in that? And I think people get the wrong idea that, you know, parents just like to exercise some kind of authority. I think that's the little kid's view, you know, that they're being mean. But I think about it now and it actually makes it actually bothers me that I did that. I mean, I was young and, and confused and whatever, but um, that had to be super difficult for him, yet the right thing to do. So, you know, how much more can a heavenly father discipline us in a loving way? But I also want to be very, very clear. I don't want people to think that every hardship in their life, everything that they've gone through, because I'm sure you either told yourself this or other people have told you or um, God must be punishing you for something you've done. And that's why your, your son or daughter is sick. Or that's why you've contracted this disease. Or that's why you've lost all your money. Or that's why this awful thing has come to you because you've, you've, wronged, um, you've wronged God. Now he's punishing your sin. I don't want anybody to think that's God's discipline. And the reason I say that is because we don't know. We have no idea how God's working in a situation in our lives. You know, um, because I know a lot of these hellfire and brimstone preachers like to tell people that, well, that's God punishing you, you know, they don't know. Um, so let me go through. Oh, he, and Tom Holliday says here, everything, everyone needs to be disciplined. There's no such thing as a perfect kid or kid that doesn't need to be disciplined. Even as adults, we still need to be disciplined in our lives. It's a need in everybody's life because we all have a sin nature. Um, so, you know, as adults, you, we can be disciplined at work, I guess, by being written up or verbally warned or whatever. And when we break the law, we get tickets or hopefully I got a written warning when I first moved here. Thank God. Um, but, you know, it, it was a notice like, hey, I'm going to cut you a break, but slow down. So we all get disciplined for not following the rules. And it's for the sake, on earth here, it's for the sake of good order. It's for the sake of people not running around uh, in chaos. So, let's see. And Colossians 3.21. Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. So, you know, the word tells, when I say, when it says fathers, I'm just going to refer to that. As, you know, all you parents, you know, don't, don't discourage your kids. Uh, don't raise them up, tearing them down. Because I'll tell you what, I think I would rather take a physical beating than an emotional one anytime. Because there's something about, uh, yeah, words hurt. That, that old, the biggest lie ever told, I think, was all that, that sticks and stones rhyme, you know. Whoever spares the rod hates his son, but who loves him is diligent to discipline him. That, that verse has been, I think, misused sometimes. You'll get to beat down your kids and then quote that, you know. And I, when I say beat down, I mean beat down. Uh, but I think if you stick to, to what it actually says, you know, if you do not discipline your kids and you ignore everything they do, that you're not doing them any favors. Because they're going to think the world has no consequences for them. And then they're going to have things they can't get out of because they didn't learn. Um, and if they get out in the world and you've taught them, at least they know. I, I, and as parents, it still hurts you because you love those kids. But they're not ignorant of that behavior has consequences. And when we stray from God, um, whether or not we have earthly consequences or not, there's a consequence waiting that we don't want to see. You know, we don't want to be on the wrong side of God's kingdom when our life, when our heart stops beating or when Jesus returns. And that's a, that's a consequence we don't want anybody to face. So discipline, as we're talking about it in the earthly sense, is going to get to that point. That's where we're going with all that. God wants you with him in eternity. He does not want you to be lost. So when people say God sends people to hell, he's a mean God. He's not a mean God. He's a loving, compassionate, 
slow to anger, and abounding in love. We may exhibit some of those characteristics, but not like God. Because um, God can forgive and does forgive anything and anyone who asks him, asks him, we cannot do that. We don't have the capability to forgive everything. We don't have the capacity to love unconditionally. Some of us may be able more than others, but there are some things that we can't forgive. God's not like that. He has no bounds when it comes to grace and mercy. Okay, so, behold, this is Psalm 127.3, and keep this in mind, these are cherry-picked verses, and they're usually pretty good, but sometimes if they're out of context, there's issue. Um, behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb, a reward. And if you read that to someone who's not able to have kids, then they think, well, you know, back in the Old Testament, wombs were closed because people sinned. Uh, you know, my wife went through that for a short period of time. Um, you know, people that can't have children sometimes think they're being punished because they've done something wrong. And you, know, you can't go by that kind of thinking because you all know that there are a bunch, there are tons of people that we would not consider to be good people out there with kids. So we can't use that kind of logic, but we do because our emotions are involved when something like that's going on in our lives. Um, let's see. Do not withhold discipline from a child. If you strike him with a rod, he will not die. You don't get to use that one. Um, as a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. I think I'm going to end there because I'm going to say that God does not want us to live as if we think he's out to get us. He's out to... Um, make sure we pay for every sin. But he wants to show compassion on those who know that he has the say-so, whether we live eternally or don't. Because Jesus does have that authority. It's been given to him. And he shows compassion on those that know that and that live as if they have a loving and merciful God who does not want to lose them. All right. Um, I think you have Pastor Dan next week, and you will not be talking about Ephesians 6, 1 through 4. So um, thank you, everybody, for being here, being patient, and everybody joining us online.